Welcome to the Variables chapter. Our Hello World program from the first chapter is nice and all, but it isn't really doing anything. So in order to have it do something more interesting, we'll need to use what are known as variables. Let's start with a simple program that just prints the year this video was made in. We have two things to note here. We have our first variable called year, that's an integer data type and it holds the value of 2025. An integer, if you're not familiar with, means a whole number that can be positive or negative or zero, but not a fraction or contain a decimal. As for what a variable is, Simply put, a variable is a container that can hold some kind of value or piece of data. More technically speaking, a variable is a name given to a location in the computer's memory where the memory can hold a value that can be accessed or changed while the program is running. Back to our program, second in our printf, we did two things. After we have our new output string, we added a comma and put the year variable here as an additional argument to the printf function. This is how printf can read the variable's data. Second inside our string, we have a percent %i. This percent %i is called a format specifier in C, and we need to write this inside the printf string so it knows what kind of data type the variable that we're trying to print is. Is. As you can probably tell already, for integer variables, the format specifier is percent %i. We'll walk through a few more examples in a bit, so don't worry if this isn't fully clear yet. Now, let's refocus on how we wrote our year variable a bit more and the rules for writing a variable. There's quite a bit to cover here. When we write a variable in C, the format is as follows. First, we write the data type of the variable, in this case int, short for integer, and then we write the variable's name. Optionally, we can assign a variable a value at this point as well. You don't need to give a variable a value immediately, though it is good practice to give them a default value. We'll talk about this a bit more later. Also, in C, one equal sign means assignment, not comparison. So the equal sign here means we're giving the variable year the value of 2025. Lastly, we close it off with a semicolon. A semicolon in C is known as a statement terminator. Basically, it tells the compiler that an instruction or command is done. We'll discuss semicolons more at a later point in this course. Now, let's focus on this in a bit more. C is what's known as a statically typed language, meaning that every variable needs to have the data type it's meant to hold explicitly declared and checked at compile time. The data type lets the compiler know how to interpret and work with the data, what operations can be done with it, and how much size it needs to allocate for the variable. Specifically, the integer data type on the big three operating system that are x64 bit is four bytes or 32 bits worth of memory. Because of its size, it can hold a number from negative 2,147,483,648 to positive 2,147,483,647. We'll talk about what bits and bytes are later in this chapter and how they represent a value and limit the range that can be represented. Anyways, after the data type of the variable is written, the name of the variable follows next. The name of the variable is how we use and access the variable's value. Variable names have a few rules though. Variable names allow for letters, numbers, and underscore. A variable name cannot start with a digit, and variable names are case sensitive. So capital my variable and lowercase my variable would be considered two different variables. Variables can also not contain spaces, since variable names can't contain spaces, it's very common to substitute underscores with spaces. And lastly, variable names can't be the same as keywords in the C language. Keywords are things like the data types of int, char, double, or the word return. Anything that basically has a special meaning in the C language. Now, let's move on and quickly skim through a few more C basic data types. Then we'll learn to do operations with them. Let's start with the char data type. This data type is also an integer type technically, but it's short for character and it's one byte or eight bits long. The purpose of this data type is to store a single ASCII character. ASCII includes things like the Latin alphabet, numbers, and some common symbols. Since the data type is one byte long, it can't hold characters from non-Latin languages, such as Japanese, Russian, or Hebrew. We'll discuss working with non-Latin characters and working with larger groups of characters later in the course. Also, since HR is one byte, that means its maximum number range is negative 128 to 127. In order to print a char data type with the printf, we use the percent %c format specifier and pass the char variable as an argument. Also, as I mentioned earlier, char is technically an integer type, so we can also use the percent %i format specifier and print the ASCII number value of the character. In this case, for the capital letter A, we get the number 65. Next, we'll move on to the data type of double. This is a data type that can deal with decimals and generally has eight bits or 64 bits worth of memory. It can hold extremely large number ranges and around 15 to 17 decimal digits. In order to print it with printf, we use the format specifier percent %lf. By default, any numbers you write with a decimal in C will automatically be considered of type double. Next, we have the float data type. This is another data type that can handle numbers with decimals, but it's half the size of a double, as in it's four bytes or 32 bits of memory. 
with its range being the following. Also, you may have noticed for our float value assignment, we use the suffix f at the end. In C, floating point literals without a suffix are by default treated as doubles. So the f suffix is used to explicitly specify that a floating point literal should be treated as a float type. The main reason this exists is because historically, doubles were preferred because they can hold more precision data for calculations and minimize rounding errors, making doubles a preferred default literal type. Also, a literal in C is simply a raw value written out. With that, we covered the four basic arithmetic types in C. Now we'll start covering some basic arithmetic operations that you can do with these basic types. If you have two numbers, you can naturally use the plus sign between them to perform an add operation. If you use the minus sign, you can perform a subtraction operation. If you use the asterisk symbol, you can perform multiplication. And if you use a backslash between two numbers, you can also do a division operation. You can also chain multiple operators together. And just like in math, you can use brackets to control what gets done first. There's also a modulus operator in C. For example, if we have an int A with the value of 5 and int B with the value of 2, if we use the modulus operator, we can get the remainder of an integer division, in this case, it being 1. Also, these operations are limited to just ints. We can mix and match the types. We can add an int to a float or do an operation between a float and a double. Though, there's a few things to note here. When doing operations between different data types, C will automatically cast one of the types to make the operation work. Casting is simply the term used when you're taking one data type and trying to convert it into another. This is also why it's generally considered a good practice to explicitly write your cast yourself by in brackets putting the data type you want for the conversion if it will be something hard to determine otherwise. Another thing to note is when doing some kind of operation with a float or double and setting it on an int variable, the int cast of float or the int cast of double will chop off the decimal portion. This is called truncation. So it's important to keep in mind what kind of data types you're working with and what type of type castings are happening. As you work with the language, you'll develop a good feel for it. Also, these lines that start with double slashes are called comments. Comments are text that the compiler completely ignores. So within them, you can explain what a piece of code is doing or write a note to yourself. Now, with those basics out of the way, now we'll talk about some of the limitations and issues with these data types and variables. Earlier, I said an int has a maximum pause value of around 2 billion. Now, what would happen if we tried adding plus 1 to an integer variable that is already holding the max value it can hold? Depending on your compiler and system, the results can actually vary. This is known as undefined behavior, or UB for short. Undefined behavior is a term that means the C language standard doesn't say what should happen in this scenario, which in turn means each compiler and system can do its own thing for this situation. You cannot trust or rely on undefined behavior, so you have to be careful when hitting these kinds of cases. Also, earlier in this chapter, I mentioned when creating a variable, it's good practice to give it a default value. The reason I said this was good practice is because when you try accessing a variable that it wasn't initialized with a default value, this is another type of undefined behavior. The value that will be read from a variable without an assigned value is completely random. That's why it's good practice to give it a default value just in case, even if you're going to assign a different value to the variable just a bit further in your program. If you made it this far, you learned most of the basics you need for general C programming. This next portion of the chapter will be diving into more technical details and more advanced cases. Now, let's shift gears. Throughout these chapters, I've been mentioning bits and bytes a lot, so let's finally start learning a bit about them. A bit is a small unit of digital information on a computer, and it's represented as a single binary value of either 0 or 1. It is the fundamental building block for all data and computing. Working with a single individual bit is a bit difficult, so groups of A will be put together, and that creates a byte. Now, you might be asking, how does a bunch of zeros and ones represent numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or something large like 2 billion? Well, let's walk through some examples to better understand how it works. Here we have 16 bits, or 2 bytes, half the size for int data type, all set to 0. We'll be reading this from right to left. When all the bits are set to 0, the integer value is also 0. Each bit represents a number that is a power of 2, starting from 1, except the last bit. So let's plot the value values over each bit. So we get 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. So now if we want to represent the number 1, all we have to do is flip the first bit from 0 to 1, and our integer value will also be 1. If we want the integer value 2, we'll flip the second bit to 1, and change the first bit back to 0. Then to get the integer value of 3, we'll flip the first bit back to 1. Since the first and second bit are on, we can think of this as 1 plus 2 equals 3. This pattern continues all the way up to 32,767, where we have all the bits flipped to 1 except the very last bit. Now, we avoided touching the last bit throughout these examples for now. Unlike the other bits that represent numbers, the last bit here is what's known as a sign bit, which just means it represents if we should consider the number to be positive or negative. On some systems, changing a number from positive to negative is as simple as flipping the sign bit. But as of the C23 standard revision, C is now mandating something known as two's complement for sign integers. So let's walk through a quick example of that for completeness sake. Let's say we have eight bits representing the number 28. Two's complement works like so. First, we'll flip all the bits so every zero becomes one and every one becomes a zero. 
Then we'll add plus one to the flip bits and we get our negative 28 value. Since this isn't a comp sci lecture, I'll leave the integer explanations here. Now, there's two things left for us to cover. Since you know how bits and bytes work for integers, what if we didn't want or need negative int values? Or what if we know our int variable will have a maximum value size much smaller than four bytes worth of memory? What can be done about these situations? Well, we're in luck since C has four basic modifiers that we can use to address these situations. This includes signed, unsigned, short, and long. We'll cover signed and unsigned first. When you add unsigned in front of a char or an int, this changes how they behave. An unsigned char and an unsigned int still keeps the same amount of memory, but they no longer accept negative values. Instead, their positive range will increase by one bit's worth. Signed in practice functions the same way as the base char and int behave, as in they can accept the positive or negative number value, so signed isn't really written out much in code. Next, we have short and long. A short is a signed integer data type, similar to the int data type, except it's two bytes or 16 bits worth of size. A long, on the other hand, is four bytes or 32 bits worth of size on Windows, and it's also a signed integer data type. Now, this probably sounds odd to you, why do we have an int and a long when they're both integer data types with the same size of bytes and they represent the same value range? Well, this is a bit of a story. C is a very old language that was first created in 1972. Computers and architecture that are modern and widespread today like x64 didn't exist when C was created. So the computing landscape and constraints were quite a bit different back then. So the official C standard didn't actually mandate a specific size for data types. Instead, they specified a minimum size of bits a data type should have. So there's a bit of flexibility in the size of certain types, depending on the system and architecture. Originally, the int data type was 2 bytes or 16 bits according to the C standard, but as we're in 2025, nearly all modern systems that you see will treat int as 4 bytes. Long, on the other hand, is 8 bytes on Unix systems, but still 4 bytes on Windows systems for backwards compatibility reasons. Now, before I give this next little piece of advice, let me prefix what I'm about to say with something. It's perfectly fine and acceptable to use char, long, and int as they are. You generally don't need to worry or sweat the sizes too often or too much, though if you do want to write code that can run across multiple systems and architectures, this can become a pretty big problem. How do we write code using data types that can be different sizes on different systems and different architectures? Well, C has a header file in the standard library to help us deal with this, known as standard int.h, and it provides multiple data types of specific sizes and configurations. So instead of gambling on the size of a long, you can instead use N64T, and you can be certain you'll have a signed 64-bit or 8-byte integer on all systems. Though, these type names are pretty awkward to type, so something that is incredibly common in many C C++ projects is alias will be created for these types. Specifically, they'll use the C keyword type def to create aliases for the specific size types as follows. The pattern will generally be something like I and the size of 8, 16, 32, 64 for signed integers, and U and the size for unsigned integers. If you use a more modern language like Rust, or you even dabble with Zig, this should look familiar to you. A lot of more modern systems level languages mandate the size of the data types, so these things aren't a problem. It's unfortunate C still hasn't reached a standard solution for this, but that's where we're still at today. If you're planning on writing code that should run across multiple systems and multiple architectures like a library or an application, I would recommend as a best practice to use these standard size types or aliases so you never have to question if a certain system does something odd with the size of a long integer type, and you can prevent an entire chain of possible issues from ever appearing as bugs in your projects. Lastly, there's one more thing to cover. Let's leave the integers behind us and look at the float data type once again. Let's say we want to add together two floats with six digits of precision, but we use seven decimals of precision in the printf statement. Here we get something odd. Instead of getting 3.00003, we have 2.9 at the end instead. This is a known issue of floating point math on computers and a decently large topic, so we'll hold off on an in-depth explanation and walking through how the bits and bytes work for floating points. If you're interested, you can search up the IEEE 754 standard for more information and gritted details on why decimal math is odd on computers. Though, to give a quick and simple explanation, basically there are not enough bits to actually be able to represent that much precision data. With that last note out of the way, we've completed this chapter. At this point, you should know the four basic data types of C, how to perform operations with them, and print them out accurately with their corresponding format specifier. If you watch the second half of the chapter, you should also understand what bits and bytes are and how integers are represented. You should also be aware of the four modifiers and what I'd consider a best practice to safely work with different variable size data types, along with the possible issues and limitations of floating point math and data types we covered so far.